everybody. Welcome back to Health Impact Live. We're here today with Nancy Beal. Nancy is a bona fide nursing informatics superstar. Nancy was a clinical nurse for over 15 years before she was recruited by Epic, where she worked for a, nearly a decade. After Epic, Nancy was VP of Clinical Systems and Integration at NYU uh, for several years and is now in her latest role at, uh, as Chief Nursing Executive and CNIO at Telemetrics. She's working with major health systems in the implementation of remote patient monitoring and chronic care management solutions. Her work is nationally recognized and award-winning. She was recognized as the 2019 HIMSS a &I Nursing Informatics Leader of the Year. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Nice to be here. And of course, we have Janae with us as well, who's going to be helping me with questions. And um, really, Nancy, just it was so great to meet you. So good, so good to uh, hear about the work you've been doing. As you were not just an early adopter and advocate, but you're truly an architect. Let's start. Why don't you just tell, tell us about some of those early years at Epic and your journey from nurse to nurse informaticist? Well, as a clinical nurse, I uh, spent most of my clinical years working in perinatal nursing, labor and delivery, and worked with various technologies, early technologies, including a very, very early rendition of what was uh, purported to be an electronic health record, but was truly actually a uh, digital content that was then printed and documented against, but it, it was sort of my first dive and uh, dipping my toe in the waters into informatics. I was always a bit interested in some of the technologies that I worked with in labor and delivery and oftentimes would get called upon to help troubleshoot when someone was trying to order a certain lab or when their pump didn't work or um, you know, their uh, fetal monitoring seemed to be off kilter. Um, and so I always had this interest in the connection between data technology and patient care and how can we make it better? And oftentimes would ask myself, who designed this? Did anyone ever ask a nurse? And I think everyone um, in informatics has had that question. Like, who, who was responsible here? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so um, when the opportunity uh, to work at Epic came to me, um, it just seemed like the right time and the right um, marrying, if you will, of my interests in data technology and patient care and my goal really to make a difference and make it better. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure at that time it was quite, uh, you know, I mean, it was it was just the beginning. I mean, really, when we started Health Impact, it was the beginning of, you know, sort of meaningful use implementation and to think of the changes that we all say have happened way too slowly, but it must have been an amazing time yeah. to come on. It was, it was really quite interesting because Epic was new to the acute care space when I first started at Epic. And in fact, I had the privilege to work uh, on the very first uh, CPOE implementation on the inpatient side that, that Epic did. Um, and that was in the early 2000s. Um, it was truly um, an island of Epic and a sea of interfaces. And that's where I really got my um, interest in interoperability and understanding a, a deeper understanding of interfaces and um, how different systems um, really interpret data and uh, misinterpret data sometimes yeah. as well. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We just spoke earlier with Melissa Kozak and she's the founder of Citus Health. Citus Health? I don't know how to say their name but that's embarrassing. Okay, so she's also in New York and went from being in the ER as a nurse. Then she started doing um, a home health nurse. And she was telling us, you know, even recently about how it is for home health nurses with interoperability, like no access to the records and they're uploading things. Um, so when you're in the sea, you know, like you're saying like all those interfaces, Tell us both, like, why, why is that? Like, why is it still so bad? You know, it's been 16 years, right? And uh, and I understand you're still working on that problem, you know? <laughs> You've yeah. lost. It's, it's a really interesting uh, question. Um, 
Why is it? Um, healthcare is just um, notoriously slow to change. If you look at other industries and their adoption of technology and things that are possible that from a healthcare perspective, we were really challenged early on to implement because people would say, oh, it's not safe or it's not secure. Or, you can't do that. And, you know, I would always give examples and push back with examples from other industries. Do you have an ATM card? Do you trust your bank to give you money from your ATM card? Well, guess what? That's technology, right? And transactional technology, that is not all that uh, different in some ways, right? Then right. how we exchange information uh, about patients and data about patients. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, why is it that way? Uh, slow to change. I think part of it is um, out of concern for humans and, and patients, really, in general. You know, mm -hmm. people want to make sure, especially clinicians, that we're very careful and that we don't make mistakes yet. At the same time, both the lack of technology has caused patient harm, as well as the implementation has also mm -hmm. been responsible for patient harm, right? And so um, it, it's almost like, uh, you know, this illusion that we have that we're protecting patients, right, by going slower. Um, and I think really the best approach is to fail fast right. and often, right? And it's that's like how- a, It's like the drivers who are too cautious. Right. Which, by the way, I've ridden in the car with those people, and they're a hazard. <laughs> exactly. You're like, could you exactly. could you just go? Like, it's your you have the right away. I will die. Like, you know, we all know those people, and sometimes I feel like healthcare is a little bit like that. You're like, if you keep going slow, no one's going to know what you're up to, and we're not helping anyone. So when you went to that, and you get to work on those. I think it's interesting. Like you're working in an interesting problem that has a lot of moving parts, but now you moved to telemetrics, right? What made you leave? Okay. You don't <laughs> have to tell us like anything that's going to get you in trouble, but. Oh, so, um, so like, I, you, I know a lot of people who kind of go that way, you know? Well, it's an interesting evolution on my part. Um, I actually uh, loved working for NYU, loved my work and the people I worked with at NYU, loved New York, but my home is in Wisconsin and I commuted from Wisconsin to New York City for six years. And at that point, I decided I needed to make a different choice uh, for my personal health and family. Um, so that's really what drove the change. And so then when I made that decision is when I decided to go back and get a PhD. I thought, well, that'll be a good sort of transition, if you will. Um, a little yeah. crazy, but. Um, <laughs> um, it's a pretty advanced it, transition. You're like, you know what I could do? PhD. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it was something I always wanted to do. It was a personal goal. So you thought, how could I make this possibly harder than commuting? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly. So, um, you know, I did some consulting uh, during the time I was working on my PhD. And during that time, um, one of my former colleagues who happens to be the founder of Telemetrics, Dr. Brett Schillingstead, he and I uh, had worked together quite a bit at Epic. And we had always stayed connected and um, communicated over the years. And he, I knew that he was working on this uh, company and um, he called me up and he said, I'm ready. You know, I'm, I'm ready uh, to bring you on board. I need some help. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to be uh, growing significantly. And uh, I thought, why not? Right. Um, and so I started, I was still actually working on my PhD when I started with them. Um, and so that that was a bit of a challenge um, to take on uh, that new role and finish my dissertation, but I did it um, and survived to talk about it. <laughs> but um, it's been a, it's been a great transition and it's something new. Right. It's a new area for me. Um, so I've done a little bit of everything, um, and uh, this is yet another new adventure for me. Awesome. Yeah. Um, well, we, we know Brett, and that's great. It's uh, so exciting to, and he's a great guy, so I'm sure it's, you know, been a fun uh, 
to get back to knowing him and working with him. Um, and I think, you know, it tells a little bit, I know, um, about your PhD. And I was reading that it was in, you know, sort of design and, and how you got into that and why you made that choice. Because as I read that, I thought, wow, didn't she, you know, she, she's been working on that for almost two decades, I feel like, you know. Um, so to tell us a little bit about that decision to kind of explore further. Well, um, you know, throughout my career, um, you know, there have been things that I kind of continue to experience over and over. And I thought, why, why is it this way? It seems to me like nurses, from my perspective, um, oftentimes were late to the table and didn't always have the same uh, voice um, in the conversation, whether the conversation was about technology design or configuration decisions or the impact of practice um, or policy. Um, and so those were things that I thought I was more interested in how do we figure out um, technology acceptance, what drives technology acceptance, particularly in nursing. Um, and so uh, my dissertation was focused on technology acceptance with a minor in human factors and uh, design thinking. And I had done uh, some dabbling uh, throughout my career in both of those areas as well, but really looked at caring science and um, how that is really the core of nursing and how it's important that we consider the impact to the patient interaction, the nurse-patient interaction and the foundation of caring science as it relates to how and when we bring in technology and how that technology does or doesn't impact that caring interaction between the nurse and the patient. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I like if, that. And if the patient, um, I did a national survey and um, uh, if, if the nurse has to choose between the technology and interacting with the patient, pretty uniformly, the nurse is going to choose that interaction with the patient or put the patient first, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's just really the caring science foundation of nursing as a profession. That doesn't mean that they're not interested in uh, what the technology can do for the patient or the data that results uh, as a use of that technology, but it has to be meaningful and not interrupt that exchange, particularly in very um, challenging uh, clinical care situations, whether it's you know someone dying, right, or someone giving birth, or both, right, which wow. happens, right, and uh, and and really the nurse wants to focus on the patient. So how can we design technology with input mm -hmm. from nurses to make sure that they can still have that quality interaction with the patient? That it's not that's, right. that's hard. Like it sounds simple, but is that you know? I think too about um, you know technology is frequently identified as like a cause of burnout, um, cause of dissatisfaction. And I like what you said. How it's really if it comes between the interaction with the patient. Um, I'd love to hear more about about that. And I understand you just joined a budding group, the AMIA National Work Group on Burnout. Um, I'd love to hear about that and what you think nurses' role there is. Yeah, um, I, I'm very excited to um, have been asked to join that this uh, National Work Group um, on Burnout uh, to represent HIMSS in that group. And um, I think that oftentimes, it, while it can be the design of the technology or the design of the steps or the workflow of the technology, which oftentimes can be modified, right? That's configurable. But a lot of times what happens is the configuration decisions or the steps in the workflow are decided either because of regulation that's imposed or someone's interpretation of regulation, um, which may or may not be accurate. And I cannot tell you how many times in my career 
And I've, I've traveled and worked with healthcare organizations across the country, some of the most notable organizations in this country. And oftentimes people will say, well, the Joint Commission says, and then you can just fill in the blank. <laughs> more, yeah. often that, more often than not, that is not what the Joint Commission is trying to get across, right? right. And if you look at the actual regulation, um, for any specific point, oftentimes it's someone's interpretation of that, that they've extrapolated that says, oh, now the nurse has to collect these, you know, 25 data points um, in the first 30 minutes that the patient is in the organization, which is just not realistic. So right. I think a lot of times we impose that. And um, so it's got to be a combination of decision makers at that design table, along with frontline users mm -hmm. who actually do the work, right? <laughs> who actually are going to say to you, well, that, you know, because a lot of times you get decision makers at the table and they'll tell you what they think is happening. And it's so far from what's actually really happening. And then that's what the design is based off, what they think is really happening or should happen, right? And it's so far from what's actually happening or what's even capable of happening that that's where the divide comes in. Right. I, I don't see how it could be confusing. You just tell it through five people and then give it to an engineer. <laughs> Zero possibilities for problems. <laughs> well, you know, and I do think what's interesting, I mean, we've seen over the last two years where there has the, has been this rapid adoption, this rapid change within healthcare, you know, with you know, certainly the move towards home health and virtual, virtual care and rapid technology adoption, right? That all of a sudden it was, uh, you know, a necessity and therefore everything was okay. And now as we come out of it, it's, you know, there's a little bit of, what is still okay, what's going to be okay, what innovation do we keep or take away? I mean, in the work that you're doing now, have you seen that, you know, are you seeing that um, continue throughout and, or has there been a true paradigm shift term, in terms of kind of balancing that risk versus progress and innovation? Yeah, I, I think, I think we are moving in the right direction. I think there's no doubt about that. And some are moving faster than others, and some are still really, you know, held back by their perception of regulation or policy or the way we do things is still a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's interesting, every organization has their own nuance um, to, you know, one of those things, right? And, uh, but I, you know, I think people are ready. Uh, consumers are definitely ready and have different expectations. And we have to get organizations more comfortable with uh, understanding that consumers are ready. We have to trust them with their own data, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example. My own mother-in-law um, recently um, had some heart issues and she periodically would check her blood pressure. She checked her blood pressure and her heart rate came up on her blood pressure monitor as 37. And she said, hmm, I think this is really an old device. I'll just go buy a new one. Now she's not on remote patient monitoring in the community where I live. Um, and uh, she went out, she bought another blood pressure monitor, came home took her blood pressure and guess what it said, 37. Mm -hmm. And so um, I promptly went with her to the emergency room and, and, it, and it turns out she had atrial fibrillation and needed a pacemaker, mm -hmm. right? And- You're on um, yourself in the hospital, <laughs> normal, yeah, sounds normal. And, and um, you know, this is somebody who is in her mid eighties and very astute, very tech savvy, um, she's been, you know, texting for 15 years, uh, or more, right. She's definitely, uh, an adopter of technology uses the patient portal that's, um, available through her provider. But again, it's about, um, you know, 
organizations and providers trusting patients to know their own body and be savvy enough to recognize, huh, this is probably a problem. I should pay attention to this. Um, uh, and, you know, technology and data remote patient monitoring can really go a long way in helping patients and clinicians have better communication about what's really happening. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that, and that I think, you know, recognizing the, you know, that promise of all of the data, which then does become hard to manage and hard to use and turn into knowledge. But, um, you know, that is the, the why behind why, why we've been working so hard to get technology in place. Right. And no question there was going to be growing pains and challenges and, you know, nobody likes change and, and things are harder, but I do think, you know, that we are finally seeing some of that promise come to play, you know. Um, I know telemetrics has their uh, big pilot that's been in place, you know, with Memorial uh, Health uh, Care in Florida, right? It's the, the one in Florida. Um, tell, have there been any particular learnings, anything, I mean, especially given the year that it's been, um, where I imagine there's been a fair amount of, of remote uh, patient activity and all of that. Um, What's the, you know, kind of takeaways from that? Um, yeah, well, I think, um, boy, uh, we've had a lot of learning, certainly at telemetrics and definitely at the health system as well. Um, and I think that, um, you know, if you look just back at the very first month that we launched this uh, pilot with this health system, um, there were 15 heart failure patients, pretty sick patients. Hmm. And with those 15 patients, um, we were able to prevent in the first 15 days, 11 readmissions. Two patients actually did go to the emergency department, but they were for unrelated um, issues, not related to their condition um, uh, that was being monitored. But I think it speaks volumes about the potential. Since then, we have definitely expanded um, our reach both in the breadth of services that we offer, as well as to the population of patients. Um, and are, have looked at are now, instead of just those, starting with just those heart failure patients, we're um, doing some population health care management and um, also um, some ambulatory care. So when a provider sees a patient within their visit, they can actually prescribe uh, remote patient monitoring right from that visit. Okay. And I think one of the things about our system that um, makes a difference um, is that it's so embedded into the clinician's workflow and what the patient already knows related to their portal, patient portal, they don't have to learn something new. It's just part, they order just like they would order anything else. And it comes over to us and we handle all those details in between. And what I mean by that is we connect the dots between making sure that the data that's in the patient's demographics is actually accurate for shipping before we ship out devices. Um, we, once we uh, send to our supplier the information to ship the devices to the patient, we track that shipment. And then once that shipment has been delivered, we make yet another call to the patient to onboard them to actually get using their devices, answer any questions they might have about the devices or the program, and uh, just really get them going, sort of jumpstart their um, data collection and use of remote patient monitoring. And then we reach back to them if there are any gaps in their data or compliance. Uh, hey, by the way, we noticed you haven't stepped on the scale in the last three days. Um, it, do you need new batteries? Uh, do, you, do you have any questions? Is the scale not working? And can we have you step on the scale right now while we're talking, right? So we try to connect those dots to make, um, you know, certainly a couple things. One is more compliance, greater compliance, which will give us more information about what's really happening with the patient to better manage their chronic conditions. And then certainly um, from a billing perspective, Medicare and Medicaid um, will reimburse you um, if you have at least 16 readings or more per month, right? So we make sure of that. 
Um, so those data points uh, allow us to be more successful and have better outcomes. And so what's next? Uh, you know, and this has been, um, you know, the, the first one and there's lots of great information coming out of it. Tell us about, you know, kind of what your focus is now. Ah, good question. We have uh, several um, health systems that are actually queued up, uh, one that's kicking off next week. Um, and uh, in addition to device-related patient monitoring, we have partnered um, first with other device companies so that we're now also getting into things like AFib detection and continuous glucose monitoring and continuous monitoring um, that's physiologic monitoring that goes beyond just taking your blood pressure periodically or just getting on the scale daily. It's continuous monitoring via a patch. Um, and uh, so those, those new opportunities will also allow us to um, help new populations of patients. In addition to that, we have partnered with several companies to do what we call deviceless monitoring. So um, one company does uh, remote physical therapy. And today, um, before working with us, they are working in a standalone system. Well, that data doesn't seamlessly flow to be in the view of the providers when they're looking at that patient's electronic health record. And so we really can be that conduit to help them get that data seamlessly, both from the ordering perspective and again, from sending the data back into the electronic health record. The other thing I would mention is that we're excited. Um, we uh, consider our, ourselves to be both device agnostic as well as EHR agnostic. And we are starting a couple of new projects with two uh, new EHRs. So uh, not new EHRs, but new to us EHRs so that uh, we have a broader um, reach in terms of being able to reach other populations. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and it sounds like just great work and it's just picking up. So it's very exciting. Um, as we, you know, kind of running out of time a little bit, but I, you know, and I, I could sort of dig much deeper into all of that. But when we, I know you've been very active in terms of policy and, um, you know, your work on that front. When you think about kind of where that, you know, where the work between, you know, the disconnect, I guess, between kind of, the regulatory burdens, the documentation, the needs, and then that progress in technology, you know, where do you think we need to go as both a, the delivery system and, and, you know, maybe from a reform or policy perspective, um, or even an organizational perspective to change in some ways the culture of nursing to get them more involved? What are some of the things that you think organizations can do to support that change? So uh, one of the big initiatives that I've been focused on for the last uh, couple years now um, is the unique nurse identifier. Um, while nurses may hold licenses in uh, multiple states um, and some have what, what's termed a multi-state licensure, um, each state has a different number. Um, attached to that nurse. However, every single nurse when they are licensed um, get what's called a NCSBN ID or the National Council of State Boards of Nursing ID as soon as they are licensed. And that number never changes for the entire uh, career for that nurse, regardless of what state they practice in. And um, so at, in several of the different um, circles in which I travel, one which is the Nursing Knowledge Big Data Science uh, work group out of the University of Minnesota, and the other is um, co-chairing the Alliance for Nursing Informatics. We have been very focused on moving forward the use of the unique nurse identifier by health systems and also by vendors right, to identify nurses. And we believe that that will um, facilitate multiple things that will uh, benefit nurses and patients. 
One is that it makes, it facilitates interoperability. If you're all pointing to the same number, it becomes very simple. There's no question which Nancy Beal you're talking about. There's one number that's assigned to me that has not changed since I was licensed as a nurse. The second is that it makes it easier to tie the nurse to the work that's done by that nurse within the electronic health record and other technologies to then be able to look at some of that metadata and tie that to outcomes and say, yeah. what are the things that nurses do that contribute to that patient's outcome? And how do nurses make a difference, right? And then um, at some point, uh, you may or may not be aware that many places, especially in the acute care space, nurses are billed as part of the room and bed charge. Um, from a professional status and the contributions that nurses make toward patient outcomes, this will enable to identify um, where nurses are making a difference and how you might be able to charge differently as opposed to lumping nursing care generically as part of the room and bed charge. So there are multiple benefits to using the unique nurse identifier that we believe will forward um, the work of nursing. Wow. I, yeah, I had no idea about that. And that is amazing. So the, the identifier exists, but it's just actually using it from a tracking and, you know, sort of you, even, you know, billing or documentation standpoint. Yeah. And, and actually for consumption, um, you know, the NCSBN uh, provides an application programming interface or API mm -hmm. available to pull that data. Right. Yeah. So it all the connectivity is possible. We have to make sure that systems and technologies have a placeholder for the unique nurse identifier and that everybody is using it. And the more we use it, the more benefit we're going to see from using it. Right. Wow. So what needs to happen? Are we waiting for an entrepreneur to come up with that, you know, <laughs> to use that API and, and make that? Or is there a policy piece? Or is it just an organizational, you know, sort of different dashboard or starting to look at that? What's the, uh, what's it's, the all, it's all of the it's all of the above. <laughs> Actually, there are some um, HCA has been working on a pilot um, using the unique nurse identifier to see how nurses move uh, across their system. So if they go from one practice area to another, also to be able to see what skills um, and what background somebody has in terms of, um, you know, what settings they've practiced in. Um, Another pilot that's uh, in progress is in the educational space to look at um, using the unique nurse identifier for advanced practice nurse education and being able to use that inside of the systems that are being used in the education space in universities. Um, and then um, certainly, um, uh, there is a group, core group of us who've been involved in writing articles and advocating for this that um, recently had a meeting with Epic to talk about how they could make sure that they were facilitating the work of or providing a space for the unique nurse identifier inside of their provider master file. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, um, really advocating um, from a policy perspective, there's a lot of work going on with the US core data for interoperability. And uh, there is a segment there of a recommended data element related to the care teams. And we would advocate that where that care team member is a nurse, they should be using the unique nurse identifier. So mm -hmm. it's really kind of all of the above in addition to healthcare organizations making an independent decision to say, hey, we're gonna use this number to identify nurses. Got it, got it. Um, well, that's, that's a lot, it's a good call to action. Um, and thank you so much for joining us and being here. And I'm so glad, it, you know, uh, I can't believe how many lines of connection that we have. Uh, yeah. We didn't even talk about um, RX Health, which of course, um, you know, we know and have worked with them quite a bit. 
So hopefully we can have you back and we can continue our discussion and hear more about the great work you're doing at Telemetrics and, um, you know, see you at a future health impact event or, of course, at the Digital Medicine Con Conference in uh, December. That would be great. Great. So much. Uh, nice to, to meet both of you and chat with you. And I really, really enjoyed this. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nancy. Thank you.